Okay, uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, indeed, a pleasure to interact with you in this uh, very interesting set of uh, talks that have been organized under this program, Envision 2022. As you all realize, uh, the construction sector is responsible for a lot of CO2 emissions. Uh, building construction is responsible for nearly 20% of uh, worldwide CO2 emissions. And much of this actually comes from cement. About 8%, close to 8% of CO2 is coming from cement. So obviously, touching this industry and ensuring that we reduce uh, the CO2 footprint from concrete, I think that can be one of the biggest contributions to lowering the overall CO2 emissions and lead us more towards this goal of net zero. So with that in perspective, I've talked primarily about cement and concrete in my talk. Of course, uh, you'll also hear about steel later. And uh, a little bit on alternative fuels also I'll try to cover as we go along. So, one thing you need to understand is concrete, everybody thinks that it's really bad, but, okay, I already said what is bad about it, in terms of 8% of uh, CO2 emissions coming from cement manufacture, and uh, talking about the overall impact of construction, because concrete is used in very large quantities. We use nearly 25,000 uh, million tons, or 25 gigatons, on an yearly basis. So, it's the second most consumed material after water. So you can see the impact is really significant. The reason why concrete is vilified is because we use so much of it, and because we use so much of it, the net contribution to the worldwide CO2 emissions is very large. But what I can tell you as a researcher in cement and concrete for the last 25 years is that in the foreseeable future, we really don't have any material that can replace concrete for the purposes that we use it today, right? Uh, whether that's good news or bad news, it's good news for me because I can continue to work on the subject for a long period of time. <laughs> it may be bad news for people who think that concrete is bad, but please remember this, embodied energy for concrete is lower than for several building materials, including wood, glass, or steel. Of course, with wood, we have the reasoning that it is recyclable. We can clear up forests and regenerate forests by planting new trees and so on and so forth. But this economy with wood does not really work out very nicely. Uh, and in the long term, because we have a large population, clearing out swaths of forest is not a good idea for us because that would mean resettlement of a lot of population in the areas that have been cleared out. It's not the case in Canada or the US where they have sufficient amount of forest reserves and they can continue to do this because they have a controlled population. So for developing countries or as we like to call it, emerging economies, concrete is perhaps the most viable option as far as construction goes in the future years. So again, just to put everything in a nutshell, I'm going to talk specifically about a few things here, but I just wanted to put all the aspects in, in one, one uh, slide. What can we do to lower the impact of concrete? Now that I hope I've convinced you that there's no better material to use for construction, what can we do to reduce the impact? Okay. One major thing is we need to understand is we cannot reduce the use because of the rate at which we are developing. We are only going to be increasing the extent of use of concrete. There's more and more concrete that's to come, especially in Africa and Asia. We are going to have a lot more development taking place. Infrastructure is getting constructed all over the uh, country. As you can see in India, there's tremendous amounts of construction going on. And everywhere we use concrete because that's easily applicable. You can use concrete anywhere. You've seen people using concrete in very small makeshift facilities, they mix their own concrete because it's so easy to make, right? Of course, making quality concrete is not very easy, but making concrete of any form is very easy. One approach, obviously, is to try and reduce the impact of the cement production. Now, cement has a raw material, which is limestone, right? And limestone is calcium carbonate, as you all are well aware. As you burn this calcium carbonate in the kiln, you are going to be obviously letting out the CO2 at temperatures of around 800 degrees Celsius. So this CO2 that comes out of calcium carbonate accounts for nearly 44% by mass of the calcium carbonate. Right? So an equivalent one ton of cement clinker, that is the product that you come out, get out of the kiln, can produce same equivalent mass of CO2. So one ton of clinker that is produced is responsible for nearly one ton equivalent of CO2 that is released into the atmosphere. Can't really do much. Of course, this one ton is not exactly from the stoichiometry. Some of it comes because of the burning. We use fossil fuels to burn, and that also releases some CO2. 
So overall impact is about one ton of CO2 per ton of clinker that is produced. Now, one way to reduce that is to use an alternative fuel. Alternative fuels that don't have that much impact on the release CO2. So one possibility here, as we are going more and more towards hydrogen-based fuels, is the use of hydrogen as a fuel during clinkering. The part on the clinkering itself, you really can't do too much about because the chemistry of cement is such that you need a majority of the raw material to be limestone. You need mostly calcium oxide to make your cement and we can't really do without the limestone. There are alternative low limestone or low calcium oxide cements available, which I'll talk about uh, in the subsequent slides, which can also be manufactured at lower temperatures, producing less energy and evolving less CO2. However, there are limitations to what these can be used for. I'll, I'll come to that later. So worldwide, there was actually a UNEP uh, um, report that was produced by a team of researchers who are well-known experts in cement and concrete across the world. Uh, this team basically came out with a report in uh, 2016 where all these scenarios were properly analyzed and data from the worldwide statistics was taken. And it was very clear from the conclusions in that report that the primary means of reducing impact of cement in concrete is to substitute cement using alternative cementing materials or supplementary cementing materials. And that's perhaps one of the biggest approaches that everybody has started taking without really fully understanding the capability of what can be done with it. Because just prescribing a cementitious replacement to be used, for, for instance, many of you may be familiar that we are using fly ash as a replacement for cement in construction. Fly ash is obtained from thermal power plants, and this fly ash can be quite useful as a cement replacement. But we need to fully understand the overall impact it's not just enough to say that, uh, you may have seen several buildings get uh, this uh, lead and griha ratings just because they say that we use blocks made of fly ash concrete and not pure cement concrete. But what is the overall impact is what needs to be judged. How do we judge that? We need to do a proper quantification of the impact using the available tools. Okay, the tools which are available of, to calculate these impacts are again European. And the data that we try to fit in is Indian usually doesn't really work out well. So we really need to collect this data from our cement plants and get the real data for energy and CO2 evolution during the different phases of cement manufacture. And that data is now available thanks to a lot of effort that has been put in by uh, researchers in our group. We have actually got quite a bit of data from several cement plants. We hope to increase the range of data that we are collecting to really assess the true impact rather than just saying that, okay, reducing cement by putting this is enough. We need to get the real picture here. The second is, we often go with prescriptive specifications in construction. I'm sorry to say this as a civil engineer, but we often go with specifications for construction projects that, you, that's, that tell us, in this concrete, you have to use 400 kilograms of cement. I mean, what can a specification tell me? I can design a concrete with even 200 kilograms of cement. I can reduce the impact of concrete by reducing cement quantity significantly. There are ways and means to do that. World over, people are practicing this because what ultimately matters is what you need out of concrete. What do we need out of concrete? Strength, we need durability to withstand the service environment and so on. So, performance specifications are something that are around the corner. We are hoping that we can do this a lot more than what we are currently doing and we are continuously making efforts to make that happen and maximizing the aggregate. We, we put stone and sand inside concrete. Many of you may think that, okay, concrete properties should depend directly on the cement. Yes, they do, but that doesn't mean that simply increasing cement would make concrete better. In fact, it is the opposite. You can actually make concrete better by introducing more and more of aggregate in it. Why do we use cement and water? Because it makes the concrete workable and moldable. Otherwise, we could just construct with stone of course, there's no real uh, source of such large amounts of stone available, and it severely restricts the kind of shapes that we can build in. So concrete gives us that opportunity to be very creative with our shapes because we are producing a composite along with steel. Right, so I'll talk, touch upon the aggregate part later. As I said, alternative cements can be useful also, like special cements that are supposedly carbon neutral. I'll give some examples of this. 
and also some low carbon cements such as calcium sulfur eliminate belite cement, which is very popular in China. Uh, but again, there are specific limitations with which you need to uh, look at this. Since we are using a large quantity of aggregate, that is stone and sand and concrete, why not make use of what is already available from the demolition waste? Construction and demolition waste generation is only increasing on a daily basis all across the world, more so in India, where we are regenerating, we are rebuilding. So there's tons and tons of waste. What is typically done with this waste? Our guys say that they are taking it and putting it into low-lying areas. That's not the case. They are going in the middle of the night when nobody is watching and dumping it wherever they want. Right? That is a real criminal attitude adopted by our agencies. This material is quite resourceful. We can actually put it back into the process to make new concrete. And that's what we increasingly need to move towards. The other approach, which I'll talk again in slight detail about, is carbon dioxide curing or CO2 sequestration within concrete. Now, sequestration is a term which does not truly apply to concrete because the extent of CO2 that can be actually sequestered in concrete is limited because of the chemistries. You can't keep on adding more and more CO2 into the concrete. Beyond a certain level, there is nothing to really bind that CO2. So there has to be a limit to which you can do it. But one option you do have in precasting factories, for instance, is the fact that you can use carbon dioxide during the curing process of concrete. That means as the concrete is hardening and developing its strength, you can infuse carbon dioxide into the curing chamber, and that produces a set of reactions that are different from the conventional hydration reactions. And one important way to actually reduce the overall impact is also looking at repurposing older concrete elements when possible. You may have seen that several heritage monuments which use large blocks of stone, when part of the monument gets ruined, they still recover these stones, they actually mark these stones perfectly in the position that they are supposed to be, and they actually reuse it. Reuse it exactly in the same form as a dimension stone. Similarly, people have to look at design strategies with concrete where we can simply extract the existing concrete elements and reuse it in a new building because concrete on its own does not degrade. As long as it has been designed properly, concrete on its own does not degrade. It's the, the problem is basically the steel inside. Steel has a limited life because of corrosion. The purpose of concrete at the cover is to prevent the corrosion of the reinforcing steel. That's what keeps the structure intact for several years, hundreds of years, right? We have designed, uh, we, have, we are recently designing a concrete structure which needs to stand for 500 years. It's a monument, so it needs to work for 500 years. So the, uh, the, the decision there is to go with stainless steel because normal reinforcing steel has a limitation with respect to its life cycle of 100 years. We've also designed concrete, plain concrete, because plain concrete is nothing but an artificial rock, okay? If you don't have deleterious chemicals around this plain concrete, nothing can go wrong with it. It will last for as long as you want, just like a rock. Only problem people don't know is how long can it last? We don't have any records, but records are there from Roman era, that 2,000 year old concrete, even in seawater conditions, has survived and is still intact. Okay, so there's a lot of, if you do some Google search on Roman concrete, you'll find very interesting studies that have been reported. Anyway, so idea is to repurpose concrete elements without really having to make new concrete, but that really takes a lo lot of effort, okay? And of course, what can we do with new construction? Simply make concrete last long. That means design for durability. And that's where your performance specification will help. I don't care what you put in the concrete, provide me something that lasts for 100 years. So design for durability is an approach that civil engineers have to take to ensure that they don't have to keep on rebuilding from time to time. So again, just to give you some data on supplementary materials, there are several supplementary materials. All of you know that the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust are silicon and aluminum. So all the supplementary cementing materials that we use are some form or the other of aluminosilicates, right? Cement itself is calcium silicoaluminate. See, calcium, silica, and alumina are the primary compounds present in cement. But we have a range of other alternatives which could be possibly used, like fly ash, which we have been using for a long time now. Uh, in fact, in the market, if you want to buy something to build your house, you can only get what is called Portland porcelain cement. And that is basically cement mixed with fly ash already, okay? 
Last one is slag. We do have Tata Steel here. So they know very well about the process of manufacture of steel in the blast furnace. We can extract the slag, quench it, and that becomes a very nice material for cementitious replacement. In fact, it is such a good material that you can replace easily up to 70% of cement with slag. Right? Of course, in terms of quantities, the extent of slag that we have is limited as compared to the amount of fly ash. With fly ash, we have a lot of quantity available, but only part of it is actually usable because it's of a good quality. You may know that in thermal power plants, they have these ash ponds, right? They build very large ash ponds where all this extra ash that is not being sent off to cement manufacturers or to concrete producers is simply being slurrified and dumped. So there's a big environmental hazard there because those fly ashes do not meet specifications. They cannot be used in cement manufacture. And there's no other way but just to dump. And that's going to create a huge environmental concern because fly ash can have heavy metals that can leach into the groundwater. How do you prevent these heavy metals from going to the groundwater? Put it in concrete. Concrete is a very good material for preventing leaching of these heavy metals. Okay. So, But then to use it in concrete, it has to meet some specifications or at least be brought to a level where it can produce concrete of a certain quality. Okay, so fly ash is a challenge because a lot of it is in, not, not in good quality. Uh, natural pozzolans, volcanic ashes, that's where the name pozzolan actually comes from. It's from Italy where first evidence of volcanic ash was used. Volcanic ash previously was used simply with lime mortar to make it more durable. Right? The Roman concrete that I talked about has used pozzolan in the uh, pozzolan is basically silica that is amorphous. Okay? Silica or alumina that is amorphous that can react with the lime in the cement to produce a good composite. So pozzolan, natural pozzolana or volcanic ash is available everywhere in the world, but we don't know where exactly it is available because we have not prospected for it. We have not really found it because volcanic events have happened over several geological eras. We don't really know how much of it is available. Burnt shale, silica fume, rice husk ash, these are all available but very small quantities. What is available in very large quantities is clay. And if you can burn this clay, make it activated, exactly what happens when you actually put clay also in a cement kiln and it reacts with the limestone. But here, if you can activate clays, they also become very useful cement replacement materials. So that's where we are looking at for the future, increasing amount of calcined clays to be used in construction. Now, of course, I'm not going to touch upon this in a large way, but overall, Supplementary materials seem to affect very positively all the three aspects of sustainability as we define it, right? Social, environmental, and economic. Now, of course, uh, there's a little bit of chemistry here. Calcium-rich supplementary materials fall in the category of hydraulic cements. They can react with water on their own. But slag cannot react with water on its own. It needs some activation, generally by alkalis or sulfates. Fly ash, on the other hand, whatever you do, it cannot react on its own. It needs the presence of lime. Now, lime is generated during cement hydration. That's what makes it pozzolanic. These binders react with lime during the process of hydration. But this reaction can go on for a very long time. So when we start using supplementary materials, your concrete can continue to gain strength and durability as the age goes along. Uh, there's another way of using these aluminosilicates is by making them into alkali activated composites. So if you take a fly ash or a calcined clay, it's aluminosilicate, what you do is you, you dissolute it with the help of a very highly alkaline solution. Typically sodium hydroxide, you can put in extra silica with sodium silicate or potassium silicate, and you can basically uh, dissolute it. And then what happens later is a recrystallization or repolymerization of this silica and alumina together to form the silanol groups, which lead to the hardening of the structure. So this is one approach, but then you are handling chemicals that are highly alkaline, hazardous. This is not something that is on, can be done on a regular day-to-day -day basis. It has to be done in controlled conditions where you can work with these hazardous chemicals. So geopolymers or alkali-activated materials are also one of the possible solution for reducing the impact of Portland cement. Because here, we don't have any cement in the system. We are only using these alternative materials. But we are limited by the amounts that we can produce because of the need for these hazardous alkaline solutions. So the other special cements that are being talked about a lot in the world, 
uh, one is calcium sulfur aluminate belate cement. <clears throat> so here, the temperature of production of the cement is lowered. So the amount of energy required to produce the cement also is lesser than ordinary Portland cement. And the overall process evolves much lesser CO2 because the extent of limestone in the mix is a little bit lesser. Okay. It has problems of stability in the long term. So there are still some challenges with the use of this cement. It has some problems of early strength, which is why in construction projects which are dependent extremely on early development of strength, we have a challenge of using these materials. Uh, there is also some new cements, or rather relatively new cements, like magnesia-based cements, which are reported to have a net negative CO2 impact because they absorb CO2 during the process of their hardening. And also the Wallace-Knight-based cement, which is calcium silicate-based cement, which is uh, quite popular around the world called Solidia. Again, commercial uses are still restricted. A lot of research is still going on with respect to Solidia and the need for carbon dioxide curing to make the cement. Now again, I talked about the fact that on the Earth's crust, most of the elements are, the Earth's crust is abundant, obviously, and silica and alumina. They are all calcium, iron, uh, your uh, sodium, magnesium. These are the lesser available elements. Cement is already using a highly optimized combination of what is already available. Okay, so truly speaking, alternative to cement as such for general purpose construction is really not clearly visible. Alternative to cement. So the challenge obviously is to still come back to the fact that you need to maximize use of these blended cements which make use of other materials along with the cement because of the synergies that are involved. Now coming to the other end, the aggregate. Aggregate is your stone and sand. Okay? We've been using for a long time river sand for construction. These days, river sand cannot be used because dredging of rivers is not allowed in several states. Now, they've completely banned it in several locations, which is also not a good idea. Some controlled dredging is absolutely important so that we can maintain the flow of rivers in the right way. So what happens is, because river sand is not available, we are increasingly relying on Stone that is crushed to sand size. So naturally occurring stone, like granite in uh, Tamil Nadu or basalt in Mumbai, is crushed to sand size to make it suitable for use in concrete. Right? So this is basically the alternative, alternative natural avail naturally available sand. But apart from this, you also have manufactured aggregate that could be made avail available from the industry. For instance, granulated iron slag aggregate could be one aspect air-cooled iron slag aggregate, for instance, the blast furnace slag, which is reactive and is used in cement manufacture, is the quenched or rapidly cooled slag. If you can air-cool it, the slag becomes more and more crystalline, and because of this, it does not have much reactivity in it, and this can be have, this has a good potential for using uh, as an alternative aggregate in construction. But again, the quantities are limited by the extent of slag that is available. Steel slag aggregate, which, which is produced from other furnaces, which have some challenges because of the high metallic content, which makes it very difficult to grind, right? Steel slag will have a lot of iron in it. So grinding this becomes a big problem. So again, you are spending a lot more on energy there, right? Copper slag, again, could be a possible option where it's available. So these are more locally available. They can't be trans... See, aggregate, the problem is you use such large quantities that you have to use what is locally available. If you really want to be sustainable, you have to make do with whatever is available locally. You can't carry a material just because it's lower CO2 energy from 1,000 kilometers away and still hope to achieve sustainability in your concrete. So first thing about sustainability is to make with local materials as far as possible. So if you are not able to do that with aggregate, you have a problem. Construction and demolition waste is something that is available everywhere now. The only problem is how do we channelize the use of this material? How do we set up these construction demolition waste processing units? that can make such material available for new construction. So recycled aggregate, which basically is mixed demolition waste. It contains your concrete, brick, ceramic, all, all kinds of junk is there. Steel is extract because steel has a good resale value. All the other stuff is simply junked, right? So for the other things, what you need to see is where could we have possible large scale uses? You know that there's several stretches of roadways being constructed all across the country, right? The, the layer beneath the main top surface, which is either asphalt concrete or cement concrete, the layer beneath that is basically your gravel or stone, which is placed as a drainage course. 
that's where large quantities of such material could be really used up again. Recycled concrete aggregate, which is basically only concrete demolition waste, has a very significant potential for reuse in new construction. Now, the challenge obviously with all these alternatives that I talked about, is there enough? As I said, we need 25 gigatons of concrete, almost 20 gigatons out of that is stone and sand, right, aggregate. Is there enough material available? That's something that we need to really give an answer for. Sometimes it needs processing. That could involve more CO2 emissions, more energy, right? So are we really sustainable in this process? Or does our need to use the waste material become so strong that we don't care about the additional CO2 that comes out of this? We have to make that balance somewhere. As I said, high energy demand could be there. Some aggregates may have difficulties with long-term stability. We want our aggregates to be inert in the concrete. They just simply occupy the volume. They don't really do anything over the long term. They have to bind well with the cement, but otherwise, they should be inert. Otherwise, we'll get problems in the concrete durability. And again, as I said, we need to work out a suitable method for processing to achieve the lowest energy pathway to produce these alternative materials. And again, very important that we can't just say that, okay, I'm replacing some uh, natural aggregate with recycled, so my concrete is sustainable. No, we need to evolve the right sustainability framework, get real data from these crushing units and processing units to get a true picture of what's going on. Now, I'll touch upon this carbon dioxide curing or reabsorption. Now, what happens in conventional concrete is cement reacts with water and produces what we call as calcium silicate hydrate, which is the main strength giving component, right? So what happens is uh, alternative cements sometimes have, have uh, uh, reactions which actually lead to net zero CO2 because they are absorbing CO2 during the time of their hydration. So what does CO2 do in new concrete? It leads to a new set of hydration reactions where along with the calcium silicate hydrate, you also lead to deposition of calcium carbonate species in the new cementitious components. Now, with this, you are changing the hydration chemistry quite a bit, but how much can you do? That's the question, because CO2 has very limited solubility in the water. To react with the cementitious materials, it has to come into a dissolute, uh, 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 dissolved state with which it can produce these sort of reactions. You can't simply expect that atmospheric carbon dioxide can convert cementitious hydration products very quickly. You need to have a lot more dissolution into the pore solution of the concrete. Now, this can be done to a large extent if you're doing carbon dioxide curing, right, or mixing of CO2 in the concrete. It can be done where you're manufacturing concrete blocks because in controlled conditions such as this, you can always increase the amount of pressure and concentration of CO2 in the chamber where you're actually curing these blocks. For general purpose construction, which are exposed to the atmosphere, doing this kind of a curing process may be very difficult. But then you have to realize that out of all the concrete that is used up in the world, probably the maximum amount of concrete goes in the manufacture of these blocks. Okay, we don't realize it. We think that concrete means bridges, uh, airports, skyscrapers, all that. But really speaking, the amount of concrete that goes into simple residential construction and compound wall construction is far exceeding what all goes into the infrastructure. So nearly 70% of all concrete basically gets used up in non-reinforced, non-engineered buildings. In such cases, all these technologies can be readily used. There's a, ton, there's a lot of use of this technology. You can really do a lot with this. Uh, concrete on its own, regular concrete can also undergo carbonation. Atmospheric carbon dioxide gets into concrete, reacts with the calcium bearing compounds and converts that to carbonate. If the concrete is a plain concrete, this is a strengthening process. This process strengthens the concrete. You may have seen that people have used lime over centuries. Lime basically continues to harden because it continues to convert to calcium carbonate, which hardens the structure. In concrete, it's not a desirable phenomenon if it's reinforced because the pH of the concrete keeps coming down as the calcium bearing compounds convert to calcium carbonate. And if the pH comes down, steel is not stable, starts corroding. But plain concrete, again, come back to plain concrete, there's tons of it available everywhere. We have to make use of the fact that CO2 can be reabsorbed and make it in such a way that more and more CO2 can actually enter. So just to tell you about the bigger picture, materials, as far as I've talked about, are only a part of the story. 
the process of manufacturing, of using these materials is also equally important. Much of today's emphasis is on low operational CO2. That's why we design uh, structures which have more efficient uh, lighting and ventilation systems. We make use of uh, air conditioning that can be controlled and so on and so forth. But we are not paying attention to the fact that the structure has an embodied energy that remains constant throughout its lifetime. So can we pay attention to that aspect and reduce the embodied energy by adopting some of these approaches? Now to do this effectively, one element that gets missed out of most research is policy. Policy is something that drives all of these things. If I tell you tomorrow to use recycled concrete in your uh, project, you'll say, why do I want to use it? I have good quality natural material available. If the policy says that no, in your concrete you have to use 20% recycled material, you will use it. But how do we generate these policies? We need to disseminate information, we need to get the policy makers more conversant with the technology and the science. And basically, that's what will lead to the improved usage of these materials. So it needs a concerted effort across different scales. With this in mind, I'm not going to go through the complete thing. I just wanted to introduce to you that all of these things are forming a part of our future activities under this TLC2 initiative, which is Technologies for Low Carbon and Lean Construction, where we have a group of faculty from the construction materials area and construction automation and management area to try and work out strategies with which we can reduce the extent of waste that is generated and have a very positive impact overall on the construction sustainability. Right, so I'll, I'll stop with this uh, because I think I'm, I'm probably out of time. So uh, if you would like to interact with us on this TLC2 initiative, please do drop in a mail. We definitely can talk a lot more as to the strategies with which we are going about doing this process, adopting new technologies like 3D printing is also one of the approaches that we are looking at. But more than that, we are looking at the alternative materials and best processing pathways to use these in new construction. Thank you all very much.